in the waiting room. Great. You have such a lovely picture.
Okay. okay. Well, well, thank, thank you, everyone. everyone. It's, it's really, really uh, uh, it, what, what a different, a different view, view we have yeah. today. Yeah. Isn't this really, really interesting how, how, how we how do we this? Do but this we are doing this for the sake of people who wish to, uh, being able to participate via Zoom and to actually see us. And uh, a number of people have reached out uh, and have asked to, to be able to do this and to participate in this way. Um, I see one of them, but I, I'm wondering whether we are going to have uh, one or two more join in, join in today. Um, but I, I wanted, first of all, to thank you for being here on a sunny Sunday morning uh, where, uh, you know, on, on a morning we're in, we might be outdoors, and not just holding class outdoors, but we might really be outdoors doing something else, uh, walking or doing something else. Um, and I wanted to start out by thanking you for a beautiful set of sessions for me a very meaningful set of sessions and a, for me, a religious experience. Um, I have been speaking with you about prayer for the past year and today my intention is to listen. My intention is to hear from you. And my intention is to hear from you what you've gathered throughout the past year, what you would like to learn more about, how do you intend to go about prayer, and what are your thoughts following this set of sessions that we've had. We went through our six guiding questions that really were the questions that offered for us the theme of this entire course for about a year. I'm not going to repeat all of them now. You remember them by now. Um, but I would like you to think about them. And I look forward to hearing from you today and to our concluding conversation for this set of sessions. So now it's up to you. I'm going to take a seat and I'm going to listen and if you wish for me to respond to anything or to interact, please let me know, but I'm looking forward to hearing from you. I guess I'll start and then we'll, we'll just move it along, I hope. Uh, obviously prayer is intensely personal, whether we're sitting all together or whether we're at home or wherever we are. What has had an impact for me is the fact learning why we do what we do, what it is that we're saying, because I didn't have that growing up. Uh, reform Judaism back in the 50s and 60s was very reform, and there wasn't a lot of thought behind what we did, and you saw what other people did, and you said what other people said, and that's what you just do because that's the way we do it. But understanding the history, the context of where things come from, how they've developed, and then thinking about it, at least for me going forward, I realize some people need the tradition. It anchors them. They don't want the change. They like it the way it was because that's a, a sense of security and it ties them to the past. On the other hand, you there's a thought, uh, a group of thought that says, but we can adjust to find more relevance today if you don't feel that that's relevant. So in a sense, there is something for everybody. You can find what is meaningful to you on a personal level. Uh, I, I just think that having a knowledge base is what helps us all go forward rather than being stagnant in, in what we've been, in, in the thought process that we've had for years and not being sheep 
well, everybody's doing this, so I guess I better do that. Or everybody's saying that, so I guess I better say that, even if I don't know why I'm doing what I'm doing and why I'm saying it. So now it's under the context history. That has had a huge impact for me. Wow, there's so much that I could say. Um, what I've one thing I've loved. Let what, me just say, um, Joan, can you hear us? She's muted. Oh. Okay. She's muted. She's muted. Yeah. She's muted. Yeah. I'm not sure she's muted. I she could raise her hand if she can hear. Hi, Erwin. <laughs> well, let, let me know if you can't hear me, okay? Um, you know, just a few th random thoughts. Um, I think one of the things I've loved is realizing how rooted our prayers are in Jewish text, in both Torah and, and then the, the way Rabbi Cohn has added um, some Talmudic insights, too, and, and the context of Jewish history. So that has just been such a rich experience. Um, a completely different understanding. When I'm in services now, I do think I know where the line before the Amida came from. I know the last line in the Kaddish where that came from. That's wonderful. I think also, though, when I think about everyone else going to services who haven't benefited, it almost feels like they're impoverished in terms of the uh, in terms of Jewish knowledge. So that's you know that's one thought. Um, I worry a little about how we're going to get you know, Talmudic insights without <laughs> your guidance. I was going to even suggest something. I started doing Daf Yomi, where you get a page of Talmud a day in your email. And it's, there's a, a rabbi writes a, a sort of a summary, which is, can be enough, or you can actually go into the text. And you, you know, you're part of a digital community of learners. So one thing that I think we didn't do that I think would be interesting is uh, because all our prayers, in theory or reality, are addressed to God, and most of us don't ascribe to the biblical God who punished us, the second part of the Shema that Reformed Jews took out. Um, so th there's just a myriad of concepts of the divine from Jewish theologians, scholars, and I think uh, in our own thoughts that that would be really something interesting, you know, to have explored, but there's, there was only so much time. So uh, I think for the moment that's enough for me. I don't know if you can hear me online, but I'm ready to hand this over to somebody else. Well, um, you probably can't see me out there, but I'm Jimena, and I, uh, I'm just going to speak up uh, on a personal level, I think uh, what we've learned from you, Rabbi, uh, has just given a completely different dimension to prayer. And, um, and that's just extremely meaningful to me. I also want to say that you have gifted us with these sessions in, in a way that is, is impossible to, to express. And I... Um, not only this last year when we talked about prayer, but generally in the last few years, your sessions have enriched my knowledge uh, extraordinarily, and I am deeply grateful for that. Um, you know, I'm a little newer to the Jewish, Jewish base than a lot of you, so everything... It, 
is so wonderful and exciting for me to learn. And I actually belong to that community, Margie. I read those. Um, but Rabbi Cohen, I have to tell you, I'm impressed about all the different ways there are to connect with God, and I think for God to connect with us as well. Um, the purpose of each individual prayer is just a unique way to connect, and I find that really fascinating. On a personal level, I appreciate specifically the insights into very difficult books, Daniel and Zechariah, which I dare anybody to read either in the Hebrew or the English and understand what you explain to us or even accept your explanation. But on a more general level, I think the challenge for all of us is to balance our identity with the need to live in the world we're in. And that is very, very difficult. And knowing that uh, the perfect world I left 60 years ago doesn't exist anymore. And where do we go from here? And it's not for us to finish the job. So Keep looking for that balance. Don't lose the identity and don't lose sight of where we are. Thank you very much. Um, I haven't been at all of them, um, and I often have to leave before you're done. But Can you talk a little louder? With a microphone? Put it both of them. Okay, up. is that good? Okay. Um, Erwin, can you hear me? Thumbs up. Okay, maybe if I come closer. Okay, so I haven't been at all of them, and I sometimes have to leave early, but what amazes me the most, and I have to be honest, I've cried in this room probably every time I've come, um, and I see parallels between things you teach me and things I've learned in the 12 steps, and um, it often comes up at lunch conversation with my family afterwards, and that's a gift. But the thing that other people have said that has always struck me the most is the parallels you draw across history, across uh, various Jewish texts, across secular life. I mean, your brain, I told you this, your brain should be insured. <laughs> because I don't know, I really don't know how you do that. There is no moving on from that. There just isn't. There won't be another you. We can all still make a commitment um, to do our best, but we won't have this again because you are that unique. And um, I don't remember all the things I cried at and all the lessons that I took home with me, but I know they're in there. And more than anything, I'll remember the idea of that we have to reach out while God is reaching down. It takes action on our part. And the best part of learning that from you in the biblical sense is that you do it in real life. And a lot of Reform Judaism is about repairing the world and social justice, but you actually forge the relationships with people to bring it into our community and tell us how to make it happen. And I haven't seen that anywhere else, and I've worked in the Jewish community. So I pass. We double that. Quadruple that. It's hard to follow any of these because they all said things that I agree. They all said things that I definitely agree with. Um, I too have worked in the Jewish community since I was 16 years old, only in the Jewish community, basically. And you are the reason I joined the synagogue. You are the reason that I feel so strongly about what our religion can offer to the world. Um, we are going to miss you terribly. And I think that we're all suffering now with the thought of not having Rabbi Cohen with us. Moment interject. Do you mind if I just for a moment interject? 
First of all, thank you. First of all, thank you. Um, second, and a distant second, nevertheless, second, um, it is really important to me that we take the time we have together to really reflect on prayer, reflect on our texts, reflect on our history and our identity and what it means for us to hang on to our identity in the world we live in. And as much as I look forward to being in touch with many of you, it is important to me that we speak about our material and that we come to a sense of understanding of what we have perhaps gained or started to gain in the last year and where it is that we go from here in terms of prayer. Um, please know how deeply moved and grateful I am for your comments. And please also know that it is important for me that this session not turn to be about me. So thank you. What did you think about me? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Excellent. So I will start. I'm sure other remote participants will join. Um, you know, I usually listen to everything that you say and agree with everything that you say um, until now because um, I'm going to uh, talk about you, <laughs> even though you said this is not about you. Um, I just, first of all, I want to thank you, but uh, before I thank you, I want to thank James, who is sort of a, an unsung hero in us learning together. He did a great job, um, and, uh, you know, will continue to do a great job in everything that he does. I also want to thank all the regulars there, um, whose faces I can see and I miss, um, the, the learning has been all the better because of the people and the comments and um, the, the uh, interactions between teacher and student. And um, it's really been special, so I appreciate all of you. Uh, but about you, you know, there's, there's a phrase that I've used about other teachers before. Um, I've said that people are a teacher's teacher, meaning they're just like a superlative teacher. I think that about you both literally and metaphorically because in your, in your academic career, you were a teacher of teachers, and now you're a teacher's teacher and just a superlative teacher, and I can't thank you enough for, for everything um, that you brought to these sessions. It, it's just been incredible. So I have two, two reflections based on the catalyst questions that you provided and all the material that you so warmly and graciously provided us over the year. Um, one is a continuation of my compliments and admiration for you. And the second, I guess, is a question. And if you're not taking questions, I'll just pose it as a rhetorical question uh, for everyone to think about and see if you have uh, similar reactions. Um, and if you are providing commentary either today or offline, I'd be, uh, be more than happy to get it on my second point. But the first point is, among the many things that I took away from these sessions is I, I came to prayer and participate and engage in prayer um, 
up until I was learning from you, mostly as a ritual. And, and I don't say that in a negative way. I, I think that you've taught us that there is a real importance in ritual um, and that prayer is ritualized. But you took it much beyond that, and uh, you were able to show me and us that there are patterns and progressions in the ritual, all of which have meaning. And that has actually been something very useful and practical that, it's, that has enhanced my prayer over the course of this year and up till this past Shabbat. And I think about you and I think about all of you and these sessions um, and everything that I've learned in um, that enhanced uh, prayer ritual that I engage in on Shabbat. Um, I, 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 think I, I think it was last week or the week before you helped me see that um, the, the, uh, the, the worship services are, I, I described it as a sort of spiral it sort of spirals up to a pinnacle and then sort of spirals back down. Um, that's among many things that, that I found meaningful. Um, but, but here's the, the second point I wanted to make is when I think about your catalyst questions of why do I pray and what does prayer accomplish, I think about, for me personally, prayer is an avenue towards spirituality and transcendence. And the one thing that if we were going to continue to learn together that I would like to learn more from you about is the prayers, because they are old, you know, they're, they're in, in some cases they're um, remnants from uh, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, if not more, there, there's a, even with the new uh, Sidur that, that uh, we use, there's still a kind of embedded in our liturgy that uh, creates a kind of um, separation between man and God. And in my own Jewish practice, and my prayer, um, I have a question about that. I, I, I am leaning more towards the, the, the spirituality and transcendence leads me to thinking that a man and God uh, perhaps can be one and the same. Uh, and that's, that's what I'm left with, which I think is a good thing, because as you said, we should... Uh, Rabbi, you said we should all see this not as an ending, but as a beginning. And for me, that's what I'm going to continue to work on and study and think about. We lost it. James? Can you hear me? Yeah. Now, now we can hear you again. But I can't see can you. Hear me, Rabbi? Can you hear us, Erwin? All right. I, I, I know that that. Yes, that, I know that was the hook, um, which I expected any minute. So that was fine. Um, uh, but thank you, thank you. No, no, there was no hook. It sounded like you dropped off. And if you were leaving with a question, either to be answered or to be rhetorical, I'm not certain what it was. Um, I was just saying that 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 issue of of. Um, uh, thinking uh, non-dualistically and wrestling with the liturgy feeling somewhat dualistic is where I'd like to continue my own uh, exploration. Yeah, so any, anybody that has a similar thought, I'd be curious to hear from you um, or Rabbi from you. Thanks, Erwin. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, Erwin, if I may, um, let me let me just say the following to you, 
just by way of a, of a, a response, standing on one foot. Would you like me to stand on one foot? Uh, I, can, I can try standing on. Um, uh, I, I just want to say this, and I, I, I would like to suggest this to you. I'd like to propose this to you, that at the end of the day, what we're talking about is not so much a dualism in prayer, but through prayer, the development, the growth, and the refinement of a sense of awe and of a sense of reach. And in this respect, both in terms of awe and gratitude, and in the sense of reach, and in certain ways a recognition of where we are and where we are not in the context of our world. In both of these ways, we explore different sides of what we have come to understand as scholars of religion and as practitioners of religion, the difficult word that is transcendence. And it is not so much about dualism, and I would wish for you to... There is a dualistic element to this, and yet what it really is about is transcendence. Right? And I hope that as it were standing on one foot, this is the beginning of a response that will help us move forward. Yes. So I, I sort of had a similar reaction uh, about the dualistic sense as someone who actually came to these rooms from a 12-step program where I had developed my own personal spiritual practice and then came through the Institute for Jewish Spirituality which concentrates on exactly that. And having had a more, a, a far less religious background, coming from a more Yiddish socialist training. And, um, and I loved being in these rooms. First, I love, I feel a sense of connection through services, through the chanting, even through the words. And I'm someone who, for a while, went to the gay and lesbian church, which was far more, you know, they used to do the prayers, and I'd go, oh, what the hell, what is all this praise stuff, <laughs> you know? <laughs> but I love it. I feel a connection through it. And I was struggling with that dualism. And I have to tell you that listening to you helped me kind of move beyond that to understand sort of where we're starting, why we start with praise, and how we move from that into community, and, and understanding the history, hearing how along the way things have been redacted, how the historical changes have influenced the, the pieces we do, but the underlying thread of identity. And from the first time I heard the Shema Israel, I started to feel that in my heart, not just in my head. Um, and I, my head and my heart feel much closer for the work that I have done and you have done over the last year, particularly. So thank you. Thank you. I have always felt a connection to Judaism, and I think a lot of that was because a sense of the prayers that we read, the songs that we sing, these are what our ancestors did. So it kept me connected to my ancestors. But the level of understanding now, which is probably beyond even what my ancestors knew, has made me 
appreciate even more the miracle that the Jewish people still exist. It's quite extraordinary to me. And from the very first lecture or Devar Torah that you gave in front of the board about Hanukkah mm -hmm. through all of these sessions as well. I just have a much deeper appreciation for who I am, for who my ancestors are. And I can't thank you enough for that. Rabbi, I don't know, did you receive my email with my letter to the leader of the, of the congregation? It's too bad. I will resent. <coughs> In some way, when I learn from the grapevine what's going on, the anger, frustration, and disappointment was boiling inside me. And here is the reason. Because I felt that like during the World War II when Jews were put in a ghetto and they were pushed in concentration camp and a gas chambers like a speechless lambs I could not continue to be quiet therefore as much as I have my personal journey in this temple for which I very grateful I wrote that what I really felt. And here's in, I don't have it with me, but in synopsis, that's what is, was saying. Dear member of the board, I'm sure that everybody is doing well. And when I learned that someone somehow trying to combine two congregation. I kind of was surprised, but in the same time, in a light in teaching of Judaism, it's honorable to extend your roof over your neighbors. And if they need some roof and help, I will vote for this to go through. However, I'm questioning the price. And I said the price became a lamb, Jonathan Cohn. And that is not acceptable. And reason why it's not acceptable, because over the years, talking to different people coming across, I learned that great numbers of synagogue on a green road, reason for them, that they congregation is built around rabbi. That tells me how important rabbinical function in a community. Here, they basically deprived us from what we found, what is important to us, 
that made us really to understand elements of Judaism which never been explained by any rabbis that I came across here. I appreciate very much Rabbi Klein, I said, because thanks to him I learned about five books of Moses. I learned from him and was inspired to do some research on my own and found out what is Egyptologian, Egyptian scientists trying to put equal sign between Egypt pharaohs and Jews. But I appreciate that he finally answered comments from newcomer to his lecture trying to prove it the science does not support the five books of Moses by creating a simple statement. Science answers the question how and Bible answers the question why. What's the purpose of us on this earth? And unfortunately we're forgetting we got so involved in reformism that we lost, in my opinion, understanding that reformism was, did not design and was taught on a principle, forget about Bible, forget about the Jew is only the person who is practicing Judaism. Otherwise, you are Hebrew. And we're going down the hill. Not up, but down the hill. And your lectures put a stream of fresh air, stream of light on elements that nobody could explain to me in a prayer. That's why during the Shabbat service, my favorite page was page number 63, where the Rebbe invite you to pray silently. Then I can do and say whatever I would like to say, because following what the group was chanting, I couldn't. My Hebrew knowledge is zero. That's why I ask them at the end that I hope that Rabbi Klein will extend to the member of the board and leadership his guidance to go through this merger and look at the decision to terminate Rabbi Cohn contract. I don't want to go down silence. That is not the end. That is only beginning. Unless they will do something about this. There was another thought that occurred to me and a concept that emerged that I keep thinking in terms of Jewish identity, because of the covenant, Jews really do have a duty to pray. And I think that's something that unites us and strengthens our identity very much. I mean, I think there's a commandment in the Torah to the effect that we have a duty to pray. Am I right? You taught me this. <laughs> Um, so it's very important in terms of identity to remember that there is a duty implicit um, in our daily lives.
know, I wanted to just comment on what Erwin was saying because I think, um, and I appreciate what Rabbi Cohn said about transcendence, but I also feel personally, as a result of what I've learned from you, Rabbi, um, there's more of a sense of imminence as well, a feeling that God is part of me completely when I'm praying that I don't think I had before. Um, well, I also, I can't help but saying that you're the rabbi I've been waiting for all my life. Seriously, um, I've learned so, so much. I'm very glad I took notes <laughs> from the beginning because I'll be able to, to look them over. But, you know, in terms of the duality, I think the eminence and the transcendence work in, in sort of in sync in some ways that God is wherever, the mystery, it's ultimately a mystery for me, but that I still feel more a part of it. And, you know, sometimes I think that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Sarah, Rachel, Leah, Rebecca, we feel like they're friends practically. We've been talking about them all our life. We have no idea if they existed, but they're personal. And, and God, in the same way, I think can, even though we there's mysteries, but I think it's, it's in us. It's so deep in us, and you have made it deeper for us, and I am forever grateful for that. I'm reminded of one thing you always talk, I heard you say, which was that Judaism, like other religions, doesn't promise this perfection in another life, right? Did I get that right? That, like, it won't be all good, and it isn't all going to be redeemed, and... Um, but that life is in the imperfection of it, but that, what's the quote, we're not allowed, we don't have to complete the work, but we're not permitted to desist from it. And you model that as well. And I know that this is uncomfortable for you, and I understand that it's important for you to hear what we're gonna, what we've learned and take forward, but some of us are really grieving also, and we don't have, I don't feel like I have a space to share that with you other than privately and to do it with community, which is something you've taught us is about like minion and community and why that existed. This is also part of it for us. Oh, that's right. <laughs> a comment that I don't mean to be negative, <coughs> but praying is very personal. And if you look at all the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, they all fractured in many, many ways because there is an element that says there's unique connection to God and my group got it right more than anybody else. Well, that gets down to personal, where you have a connection and I think Rabbi Cohen helped all of us find that personal connection. And it may not translate to all the people in this group the way you get it. Okay? So hang on to it. Realize that Catholics and Protestants don't agree, or evangelicals, or whoever, Shia and Sunni kill each other just for the fun of killing each other. And we as Jews have great differences with each other, but we still hang on to it because we own it. We own the Bible. And I've just been reading uh, the philosophy of different Zionists, and it's incredible how different they are in what they really believe. And if you don't think I'm right, turn on the news and see what's going on in Israel today for 20 weeks now. And it's personal, very, very personal. I'm going to bring it back to prayer because I can't repeat again what everybody is feeling about you and this class. This has been phenomenal. I grew up in this temple 
we learned to memorize the prayers. The prayers to me were thanking God and then asking God. That's all they were. And you have added an incredible dimension to the value of prayer that I had never learned before. I'm only glad that these sessions were recorded so I can go back with the prayer book and listen to each session and reflect on that prayer because I can't do it on Friday night services. We just go too quickly and um, parts are eliminated, parts are added, and it doesn't come down to the basic sense of prayer that you presented. And I'm so grateful that you've been here. Well, how, do, how can we go about accessing what you said? Because if others are like me, I came with a blank page, and I was so busy trying to listen that it's very difficult to recall it in a, in a uh, significant fashion. So the second time around, it, it really starts hitting home. And I wonder how you can do that soon. Uh, this is just my thought. I feel like we're all suffering from the loss of spirituality, and now we have a glimpse of it, thank to Rabbi Cohen, and we try to understand and hold on to it. I think spirituality is a tool. It's a tool to survive. So when people talking about mystery, how the Jews survived. I think spirituality helps them to survive. I don't know if it's only prayers or it's something else. Uh, my thought about little children, I think we all, spiritual, non-spiritual, as a babies, as a toddlers, we're very spiritual being. We believe in miracles, we believe in fairy tales, I have to toddlers, uh, grandsons, and uh, anything I tell my grandson, Abraham, he believes. <laughs> he believes in this, uh, some uh, fairy lives here, and uh, some uh, miracle being under his bed, positive one. And we all believed it. What's happened? How we lost it? Why? I am thinking, then children not exposed enough to the fine arts, mm -hmm. painting and especially classical music, because that keeps your spirituality going. And now suddenly, we don't have it. I think prayers, it's the result of spirituality. It doesn't make you spiritual, it's uh, one of the tools. And a good example is my late grandfather who wasn't spiritual, born as a young Jewish person, got Jewish education. Then he was very far from spirituality. And uh, during the revolution in Russia, when everything was taken away from him and he was crushed by socialism and communism, he became very religious and spiritual. That helped him to survive. It did. I don't remember him being depressed. He was actually a happy person. He was praying. I didn't understand what he was doing. He tried to shelter me because I grew up in a communist environment. We have to be atheists. But I saw with my own eye how spirituality really helped you to survive. Holocaust, Second World War, because not everybody was in concentration camp, and even now. So I hope I will find it and you too.
one of your classes for one year. So you don't know me, but I know you, many of you by name. Um, the, the participation of the class um, has been important to, to this whole year, and your questions have very much changed, I think, what Rabbi Jonathan has been teaching and, and enriched it. So I want to thank all of you as well as thanking you, Jonathan. Um, I'm a Christian. I live in Indianapolis, and uh, I'm probably going to start crying. Um, my, my faith has been deeply enriched by this year. Um, I've always kind of never known quite what to call myself, but after this year, I'm calling myself a Judean Christian, <laughs> which means that, um, yes, you do own the, the Hebrew Bible, by the way, and um, it, it uh, has enriched me in so many ways. It's hard to put this into words. First of all, our, our prayers come from you. My prayers come from you. I uh, go to a monastery often for Vespers, and we pray, we bow at a certain point in the uh, the um, a certain prayer, and then we come up at, at a certain point. And of course, that all of this and and uh, the, our Father and all of the prayers that I've said uh, in my life um, have become deeper and more meaningful and more true. Um, I have also become aware of um, the gift of the Jewish people to me and to the world. And that prayer, Jonathan, I don't remember which one it is when it talks about the peoples of the earth. And then there's that line, I, I want to remember the exact words, but you have blessed me. You Jewish people have blessed me in my life. And that's something that will remain with me forever. And I've become much more aware of, um, well, to be honest with you, my Christian faith that I grew up in and had a lot of journeys and, and a different kind of spiritualities and knew a lot about Judaism, but this is a whole different level uh, about how, unfortunately, my Christian faith has been the harbinger and the holder of so much uh, discrimination. And I've become much more vocal in, in ways also that are subtle, but um, it's unfortunate. You know, that's a part of my Christianity that I'm not proud of. But what I want to say is that... Um, this class is, is really about living prayer, and I think that the fact that it's stopping gives us all, I, as a participant, a kind of a burden of responsibility. But I think a few of you have said this, how, how we're going to take this into our lives and how we do take it into our daily lives. And some of the things that have struck me that have really completely played a part in my year, um, well, Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, and the idea that that atonement and forgiveness is everybody's responsibility. And that the person that has actually sinned is telling the person that helped atone him or actually did atone him, it's okay now, you can rest well. That, that changed everything for me about the idea of what forgiveness is. Um, Hannah and my friend in Bloomington who lost her job at age 55 and her husband saying, get over it, you need to move on. You've been depressed now for a year and a half. Just let's keep going. And your class, when, when, when Rabbi said, you know, is this okay? What Alkanah? And, and, and all of your answers about why, and it's, why is this not okay? And how many times I've listened to people in pain and tried to give them good advice and, you know, basically said you need to move on, and even without saying the words. And that came to an end when I heard that story. And, and I just have said to, to my friend, Bloomington, you're Hannah, you're Hannah, you are her, and um, you need Eli, Eli, not, not Elkanah, <laughs> and um, yeah, so these are very real, and, um, and they're not just examples, they become part of us, and I've, I've just gone through this entire year, if I couldn't be there on Sunday morning, most of the times I listened, listened after the fact, and I've listened to several of the classes many times, and I just wanted to tell you all that although you haven't known me, I've known you, and thank you for this journey that has been really life-changing for me, and I have utter gratitude to all of you, so may you be well, and yes, you do bless us all. And in Psalm, I will leave you with Psalm 115. May you be blessed and may your children be blessed. Thank you. Not yet. I'm going to speak first. I have a couple of quick comments to share. Uh, I have not been in the room often, only occasionally. 
but I do have these thoughts. First, my being in the room goes back, I think, pre-pandemic when we used to be in the museum room on Shabbat afternoon, and the earliest sessions helped orient us to the historic grounding of Reform Judaism as a movement. Comment one, Julian Stanzik. Julian Stanzik is a deceased Cleveland-based artist, a brilliant colorist, a terrific geometrician, and a man who created unbelievable art with the use of one arm. Sitting at the Museum of Contemporary Art, Cleveland, listening to a panel discussion, he heard a comment to which he immediately reacted in his thick accent, which I will not mimic. The comment was about the art on the wall. And Julian's response was to jump to his feet and say, the art on the wall? The art is not what's hanging on the wall. The art is what happens inside the human beings who see, experience, and relate to what's presented on the wall. First comment. Second comment. In our country, we have a trial and litigation value system that upholds trial by jury. And we have a value system about trial by jury because nationally, from our foundation, we feared the perspective and authority of any one person. No matter how educated, no matter how elevated, no matter how responsible. And we've seen time and again the brilliance of that value system when jurors, having had to listen for a long time, have the opportunity to chat with each other and reach conclusions. And those of us in the profession have had the opportunity to see what happens if you have an a chance to watch mock jurors deliberate and chat with each other. And the immediate impression is the wisdom that can percolate up among people. And what you did this morning was to open up the window so that wisdom could percolate up in this room among people who have listened and thought. And it is marvelous to behold. Third, Lynn manuel Miranda. Lynn manuel Miranda took the American history of those we understood to be the founding fathers of this country, turned it inside out, upside down, twisted it through a few different prisms, and represented it to us in slightly different forms with profound, huge implications. The George Washington I had learned of as being a white, wig-haired, calm, truth-telling man became a warrior in ways I hadn't ever contemplated. And skin color and cultural history and nationality disappeared. And through Hamilton, we came to understand the vibrancy and the power and the energy of people about whom we've only been able to read in history books in a way that brought things to life all anew. Jesus. I grew up imagining that Jesus was a white-skinned Jewish boy who somehow emerged to be perhaps the single most attended to human in history, if you count by the numbers of people through the centuries. 
And it's only been in the last 10 years that I personally have wrestled with the fact that Jesus coming from where we understood Jesus came could not have had skin that looks like mine. Must have looked different than history has presented him. Last comment. For me, the takeaway of all of these sessions, the ones for which I've been in the room, the ones for which I've streamed live, the ones for which I've archived streamed because I couldn't make it at that moment, and the ones that I've yet to see but I'll get to harvest in the future are two, two key messages. First, a living gift of this horrible pandemic is that we aren't always all in the room. We aren't always all able to be in the room at the same time. But it doesn't mean that we're fully absent. And for those who are able to stream at the time, for those who are able to access later, the library is full of books. People wake up in the morning, go to the library, pull a book. These are living sessions, not just what happens in the room at the moment. And B, the one that goes back to the beginning. I think my biggest takeaway from you is the recognition of this. There is milk and there is low-fat and non-fat milk. There is beer and there is light beer. Born in 1956 and growing up in this congregation, I heard people refer to ours as Reformed Judaism with an ED at the end. And I knew that wasn't right. But what you helped us understand, what you helped open up the window for us to see, is that our brand of Judaism is not Judaism light. Our brand of Judaism is substantive. It's grounded. It's based in Torah and beyond. And it is fully relevant and therefore us, all we have to do is roll up our sleeves and dig in. Thank you. Friends, um, I'm going to bring this session to a close. Um, I'm going to bring this session to a close. And I'm going to bring this session to a close very briefly by saying just four things. You can't hear me? Can you hear me now? Okay. I'm going to say four things. The first thing I would like to say to all of you and to those of you who are at home in different places is that not only has your wisdom percolated through for me every single session, but that throughout this year and beyond this year, you have not only offered me wisdom, you have offered me strength and comfort and friendship. And for these, the wisdom, the strength, and the comfort, and the friendship, I am forever grateful to you. The second thing I would like to say to you is that we are on a journey. And it is a journey of us connecting 
with parts of our human spirit, we can call it spirituality. That perhaps we have grown numb to. That perhaps in our daily lives do not always come through as they otherwise might. And that through these sessions, you have not only offered me wisdom and strength and comfort and friendship, but through our exploration of prayer, my own spirit has also grown. And I pray for that growth to continue. The third thing that I would like to say to all of you is that yes, in certain ways we are grieving and that I'm also deeply grateful for the opportunity that I have had to be here with you and that our time together is not a moment, an experience, a sentiment, a memory, a learning, or part of a journey that anyone or anything can take away from us. And so, I would like to leave you with a prayer. And the prayer is Tfilat HaDerech, the prayer of the journey, the prayer of the road. And the prayer says, may the God of our ancestors, of our mothers and fathers, the God of the generations, spare us from ill, from harm, from damage, and from loss. May we merit to travel to our destinations and bring goodness and bring hope and bring spirit in safety and in comfort. May we feel the protection of providence as we go on the journey. I wish this for all of us, for myself and for you, in my deep gratitude to all of you and in all of you, of course, are included the people who have made these sessions possible, and they include Jordan Tobin, who is not here and who has been so helpful, and, of course, our star, James. Thank you. Thank you.